before I do that, um, before I do that, I just want to introduce this is my friend uh, Jace, that's on the line. Every, uh, for those of y'all that don't know him, Romy and Rose, this is one of my really good friends, all the way uh, from when I was in college. Me and Jace played a lot of music together. Um, but, and uh, I, we got Romy. Romy, uh, he's well, another good friend from Seattle. We, he's part of our uh, ministry uh, that I just left, and uh, also Rose. Uh, all these good friends, and we should have some more good friends uh, from Seattle joining in a little bit later. But uh, so y'all know who each other is. Okay, now we can get started. Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. Today we're talking about 400 years of bondage. And most people know, most people that grew up in church, they know about the prophecy of 400 years of bondage. And what do you normally think about when you hear that word 400 years of bondage? Like, just tell me what what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Anybody? Somebody interject. I think a lot of a lot of people think of slavery. That's right. I think of a lot of people curses and slavery. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Slavery. That's right. Sla but but what slavery specifically? What slavery? Like what group of people that went to slavery right. and went? Black slavery. Black slavery? Yeah, black slaves. Okay. During what time period? The Egyptians. Okay. Uh, the Moses Egyptians. Period. Moses time. Whatever. Yep. Moses time, the Egyptians. Anybody else? Uh, the 1900s, 1800s. Okay. So we got a we got a bunch of different answers, which is exactly what I thought we would have, which is great. We got Moses, we got Egyptians, we got black people, we got you know. So I want to look specifically at this prophecy, and we're gonna figure out who's it talking about. Uh, uh, Jace, what we've been talking about for the past two three weeks, we've been talking about uh, who are the Israelites. But today we're going to focus specifically on this prophecy. So here's here's where the prophecy comes from. Genesis chapter 15, 12 to 14. It says, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, know for a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. So whenever you think about the 400 years of bondage, this is, this is the scripture that people are referring to. And my not screen, oh, I'm not. Hold on. One second. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Can y'all see it now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right.
So, yeah, so this is a scripture we just read. Um, uh, this is where that whole 400 years comes comes from. Uh, I want let's we're going to focus on a few key points, though. So. God was saying to Abraham, he was like, know for a surety that thy seed, meaning your children, your descendants, those people that come after you, they're going to be strangers in the land. They're going to be foreigners. It's not going to be their land. And when they get to that land, what they're going to do is they're going to serve them. And the people that the people that uh, are from that land are going to afflict them for 400 years. And then he says, but when you come basically at the end of that, when you come out of that land, he says, I'm going to judge them. And then it says also afterwards, shall they come out with great substance. OK, so most people think that this is referring to when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, because when the children of e Israel came out of Egypt, they were strangers in Egypt. That land didn't belong to them. They served, served them. People assume it was 400 years because it says 400 years. Um, it also says that um, he was going to judge that nation. When we look at Egypt, they experienced the 10 plagues. We also saw that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they came out with a whole lot of stuff. They had gold and silver. They had all kinds of uh, materials for making clothes. They had every single thing that was necessary so that they could build the temple. They had a they came out with a whole lot of wealth. They basically plundered the egyptians the egyptians gave them everything because they're like hey you guys you you and your god been causing all kind of chaos here in egypt just get out and go we'll give you our stuff just leave so so also in in the book of acts stephen if you remember stephen stephen was one of the apostles he got stoned and as he was get, getting stoned, uh, he he basically was sharing the gospel. And part of that, part of what he said is here in Acts chapter seven, verse six. It says, and God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. And the nation to whom they sh shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that, they shall come forth and serve me in this place. So Stephen, basically, he knew the same prophecy. And he's reiterating what Abraham spoke. So. So let's what I want us to do is figure out. Exactly when this happened. So the first the first thing we notice or one of the first things we notice is that they were going to be in bondage for 400 years. OK. And they were going to be enslaved and mistreated. Some translations say uh, uh, servants, they were going to be servants and they would be oppressed. Either way you look at it, if we go to the Hebrew, they were going to be severely held in bondage. So slavery and oppression for 400 years. And it's key that we recognize that it's slavery and oppression and not just slavery. Okay. Um, now we're going to look at one more, one more uh, prophecy that's, that some people say is related to this. Galatians chapter three, verse 17. But by, by the way, stop me at any time if anybody got a question or anything. Stop me at any time. OK, Galatians 3.17, it says, what I am saying is this. The law that came 430 years later does not cancel a covenant previously ratified by God so as to invalidate the promise. 
Okay. What I want to do is go, I want us to go to that scripture so that we can look at the context, see what it's really talking about. Um, and this is key because I think probably about 90%, maybe even more of the pastors that teach on these things are teaching it incorrectly. And because of that, you're going, you're going to see as we go through this, um, our entire view of who we are is completely jacked up. All because of some of these verses that haven't been uh, taught correctly. So I'm going to start in verse 15. Okay, this is Paul, Paul talking. He says, um, brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. So basically what Paul, Paul is saying, he's, he's speaking in, in terms of the way men can understand. And he's saying that would be a man's covenant. The covenant that he's talking about is the same covenant we read read about earlier, Genesis twelve. Actually, we haven't we haven't gone there yet. But but the covenant that God made with Abraham. This is the covenant he's talking about. He says, "Though it be man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man can disannul it or add add thereto," which means you can't you can't cancel out the covenant. And you can't add anything to, to the covenant after it's already been made and after it's been confirmed. Verse 16, it says, now to Abraham and his seed or his children were the promises made. He said, not into seeds as of many, but as of one into thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So basically what, what Paul is saying right here is that the covenant that was made, it was affirmed, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul and make the promise of none, none effect. So... Uh, Another way of saying this is that first came the covenant that was get, given to Abraham. 430 years later, the law came. The law which, was, which Moses wrote, God gave to Moses up on Mount Sinai. Does that make sense? First you have the covenant that was given to Abraham Next, you have the law, which came 430 years later. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. I'm, 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 only, I'm only reiterating this because this is, this is important. Like, if you don't get this part, then all this stuff I'm about to show is not make sense. It's, so the law came first or the torah you know we say torah in the hebrew it came first in 430 years up on mount sinai moses went up into the mountain and god wrote on those two tablets and moses brought it down and then the children of israel disobeyed and so moses he broke the tablets and then he went back and he had to get those tablets again but this time he had to write it because he broke them the first time first time okay so now to put that in a visual i created this thing this uh slide right here let me wait i hope if, i hope y'all can see. okay there it is so first we see the promise the promise was given in genesis chapter 12 before before I go there, can anybody tell me what was the promise that God made with Abraham? 
that he shall have many nations. Yeah, he's going to be the father of many nations. Yep. He shall inherit the Holy Land. Yep, he's going to inherit the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, because His children uh, will be the stars in the sky and the sand in the sea. Yes. yes. Exactly. It will be a covenant so, between God and his people. Um, he does say that, but not in Genesis 12. That's further oh, yeah, so down, that's no down the line. Yeah. So, so that's a no let's, let's go there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's go there real quick. So Genesis 12 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go out from your country, your relatives, your father's household to the land that I will show you. So, for the first thing, we know this because we've been studying this so much. We know God told him to leave, go out, don't get away from all your family to the land that I'm going to show you. He says, then I'll make you a great nation, like we, like we said, I'll bless you. He said, I'm going to make your name great. So, one thing about his name being great, it means that wherever Abraham is talked about, where wherever Abraham is known, people are going to know Abraham is blessed. People are going to know that Abraham, you don't really want to mess with Abraham. If you if you remember uh, when we were studying, when Abraham fought, fought, you know, there was four kings against five kings when Melchizedek came. And Abraham defeated the five nations. Abraham and his people, that's how powerful he was. That's how much favor he had with God, too. So that he was great when it came to military strength. He was great when it came to cattle and cattle, uh, wealth and land. He, he was great in, in terms of how, how large his family was and his household and all his servants. So his name was great. That's like his fame. It's just so that you will, so that you will exemplify the divine blessing. When people, whenever people think about being blessed by God, God is saying, you won't think about Abraham. And that's the same even to today, right now. This is basically prophetic. Because this was thousands of years ago, but even till today, we right here being the remnant, the, those of us that believe in the word and Christ, we're following him. We know how great Abraham was. But so do all the Orthodox Jews. They know how great Abraham is. So do all the, all the Christians. They know how great Abraham was. They, they look to him for being a model of how the blessing of God is. Not only them, even, even the Muslims. That's, that's, over, that's over 3 billion people right there that look to Abraham as a model for blessing. So verse three, he says, I'll bless those who bless you, but the one who treats you lightly, I must curse. When it says the one who treats you lightly, what that means is, uh, they don't take they, they, it means swift or they they don't take you seriously and they don't honor you they disrespect you that's what that's what it means he says those that teach you light treat you lightly i must curse and all the families of the earth will bless one another by your name okay so this this is what i'm referring to when i talk about the promise this is the promise that was given to abraham and see, I have that as year zero because that's the beginning of the 430 years. Okay. But then, uh, after, after, after that, as we read earlier, we see that Moses, he gave, he gave us the Torah and he did that on Mount Sinai. That's 430 years ago, four, or 430 years later. So that's what we were reading. Okay, now with that is said, with that, with that uh, we're going to ask this question, and this is what we're going to try to figure out in this Bible study. Is this 430 years referring to the same prophecy as the 400 years of 
slavery and bondage. Remember? The slavery and oppression that we just read about 400 years. Abraham, your seed, you're going on to another nation, a nation that uh, you don't, a foreign nation. You're going to be strangers in that land. You're going to be slaves and you're going to be oppressed for 400 years. Is that the same prophecy as this one that says from, is it talking about the same period of time? That's the question we want to know because that has huge implications. If we get this wrong, then there's so much stuff that is messed up in our thinking to the point that even when we try to figure out and understand who we are, we don't even know who we are because of this lie. It's a lie. Okay. Man, y'all are so quiet. I hate when y'all <laughs> quiet like this. It's... Then stop teaching so, stop good, teaching so good, yo. Yeah, we're listening, Joe. Okay. Right. Can y'all hear me? We tell you okay. this every week. <laughs> okay. I wish you stopped talking. It's... No, I'm kidding. You're doing good. <laughs> Okay, okay. All right. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, you see, on the far left hand, I have a timeline that I made. It's year zero. And then I have 505 on the far right side. What we're going to do is dig into this to see what period of time that these two prophecies are talking about. Now, this one, we already know, the 430 years, we, we kind of, we, we already know. It says from the time the promise was given, talking about Abraham, to the law, which is at Mount Sinai, was 430 years. So we, we know when this happened. This happened from Abraham to Moses. What we, what we really want to figure out is, is this slavery and oppression the same time within the same period of time? Or is it something completely different? Okay. So first we have a little baby boy. He's, he's our year zero. Okay. Who, who, who's the little baby boy? I just, just guess, anybody. Who's the Abraham's baby? father. Abraham, there you go, there you go, thank you, Abraham. So Abraham lived to be 175 years old. Um, so that's why you see the number at the bottom of Abraham. You're going to see the numbers at the bottom of different people, and that's just how long they lived. Okay. So after Abraham is born, the milestone we have is in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. And this is what we just talked about. Yah's promise to Abraham that he's going to be made a great nation. Okay, so that's, that's at year 75 of Abraham's life. Okay, so all of these numbers are... Uh, corresponding to years from Abraham's birth. So 75 years from when he was born, that's when I made the promise to him. Okay. I'm just going to check real quick to make sure I know I'm trying to join. Uh, okay, good. All right, so next, what we have, we got another baby. This one should be obvious. Who's next after Abraham? His Who's wife. the next major player? Okay, okay. I'm trying to be funny. Okay, <laughs> never mind. No, it's not his wife. It's Isaac. She is important, though. But Isaac, he lived to be 180 years old. And we see this in, in Genesis chapter 21, verse 5. Let's, let's just go there real quick. Genesis 21, 5. And Abraham, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. 
most of us should already know that because that was the miracle of, of uh, Abraham having a child when he was so old. Okay, so we got a hundred years now from the birth of Abraham, and now Abraham Abraham is a hundred. But next, we got another baby on the way. Um, man, I'm at this hotel, so my internet's kind of going slow. Just is it Ishmael? Can't see the screen. Look. Not Ishmael. Are you saying just for Abraham's line? I, I, yeah, I'm asking you to to guess the next person in succession. Is it Yeshua? Who's after Isaac? No. Jacob. No. Jacob? I don't know that line. Jacob. My bad. Yes, Jacob. Yes. Jacob. Jacob. It's cool. It's, it's cool. So <laughs> Jacob but that's right, Yaakov. So Jacob was born uh when Isaac was 60 years old. And we know that from Genesis 25, 26, okay? Okay, next we have uh, Abraham dies. Oops, I, oops, it's going a little bit too fast. I'm, uh, the picture hasn't changed right. in my end. Yeah. All I see my, is a baby, yeah, the three. The internet here at where I'm at is super slow. Uh, I'm at this hotel right now, so I'll, I'll redo it to try to get it back so you can see it. Okay. Yeah, I see that. I see okay. Jacob. Okay, there we go. So next. After Jacob is born, Isaac, Isaac, he's 60 years old when that happens. I'm not going to go through all these scriptures. Um, um, Abraham, he dies. When the Abraham dies, he's 175 years old. So now Isaac is 75 and Jacob is 15 years old. So one, what I want you to notice is that we're already at year 175. When was the promise given? The promise was given to Abraham when he was 75 years old. So now 100 years has passed from the time Abraham has died. So... So that's 100 years, okay, from the promise. Next, Jacob gets married. And he's 81 years old when that happens. Isaac is 141. Then we have another, we have another baby that comes into play. This baby is Levi. He's not the next baby. He's not the first baby that comes. Reuben is actually the first baby that Jacob has. Levi is the third baby. If you remember from, from Leah, from Leah uh, Levi is born. And the reason we want, we, we want to study Levi a little bit is because Levi is going to be the, the great grandfather of Moses. So we want to have an idea of when Levi was born. And I have a question mark here because the scriptures don't say exactly when Levi was born. But we have a, a good approximation to when he was born because we know that uh, Jacob, he served Laban for, for seven years. And then he had to serve another seven years to get Rachel. And then he served another six years before he left. After he served Laban for seven years, then Leah started to, started to have children. 
So we know, so that's, that's how we know, okay, Levi had to be born uh, probably close to the 10th year of his service for Laban. So, so we just have an approxim approximation that 244 years from the birth of Abraham, Levi was born. I hope that makes sense. And and we can go in more depth and looking at the scriptures and all to figure this out. But first, I just want to get through this first. We have another baby that comes, comes about seven years later. This guy, he's important too. This is Joseph. And Joseph, he lived to be 110 years. Now, what I want you to notice so far, look. We're at year 251. We're at year 251 when Joseph is born from the time of Abraham. Are the children of Israel in Egypt yet? That's the question. No, they're not. And it's already 200 something years have passed. We're halfway into what we could think is the 400 years. Yes, exactly. It's 251 years and we're not we've already already validated some things but let's keep going so now after levi levi has kohath and amram oh that wasn't supposed to disappear like that <laughs> i don't see him now but that's okay so kohath and amram even though they disappeared from my screen they are the children of levi so levi if you remember levi is the father of the Levites, and from the Levites come the priests. So they're the ones that are going to be working in the temple. They're the ones that are that are going to be administering all the sacrifices once the temple comes. And so Moses and Aaron, his brother, they both come out of Levi. And um, um the scripture doesn't say exactly when they were born either, but one thing we do know, the scripture tells us that Kohath was part, he was part of the group that went into Egypt. I'm sorry, not went into Egypt, went into the wilderness from Egypt. So he was living in Egypt as a slave, but he went into the wilderness. So we're gonna look at, look at a couple of those scriptures too. But now we keep going. We see that in year 281, Joseph is put in charge. It, uh, remember, Pharaoh uh, gets Joseph out of prison. And Joseph now is over all of the um, food in Egypt because there's a famine in the land. And since there's a famine, he's responsible for making sure that Egypt uh, has has enough food for themselves and uh because pharaoh you remember pharaoh had the dream of the seven cows seven of them look healthy and seven seven of them look really bad and unhealthy so joseph interpreted that dream for pharaoh and so pharaoh realizes now because of joseph's dream that egypt is going to have seven years of plant plenty seven years of famine and that happens in year 281. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to look at these scriptures too. So you're not, I don't want you just taking my word for this. But uh, so that's 281. And in the ninth year, in the ninth year uh, of the, of the, of the, uh, seven years of plenty and then the seven years of famine and the ninth year jacob goes all the way to egypt because they don't have any food there's famine everywhere and he takes his family at this point jacob is 130 years old and joseph is 39 levi is 46 years old okay now when this happens this marks when the israelites are now considered in Egypt. This happens once Jacob takes his family to Egypt to avoid the famine. 
So that's in year 290 from when Abraham was born. I know it's a little bit tedious, but it, there's a reason for all this. <laughs> so 17 years later, Jacob dies. And when he dies, Jacob was 147, or um, Jacob was 147 when he died, and Joseph is now 56. This is in Genesis 47, 28. We read that. I uh, guess I'm waiting for the screen to, it looks like it's going kind of slow. Joel, I love all of this pictures and numbers. Oh, thank you, G. It, it, it took me a while to do this and I want to do it better, but I'm like, nah, let's just go with what we got so we can get this over with. So I'm going to speed it up because I, I don't want to take too much time on this. I want us to be able to get into some of the scriptures. So after Joseph dies, um, next person that, that's important is when Levi dies. When he dies, he's 137 years old. Moses is born in the year 425 from the time of Abraham's birth, and then 505 from the time Abraham was born. Moses goes into the wilderness, and that's when the Torah is given. Moses was 80 years old when that happened. So we're going to go into some of these scriptures so we can prove this, but I'm going to, I'm going to give this handout to everyone, this presentation. So don't worry if we don't get to go through everything in detail, you'll have it so you can look at it yourself. But we see from 290 until 505, that's when the Israelites were in Egypt. So that's 215 years. So how, how now to give you an idea of how I started this so that if you want to do this yourself, I really encourage you to do it because it, it solidifies in my mind about who I am and who Yah's people are. And it solidifies the lies that we've been taught that have caused us to not know who we are. Oh my gosh. When I did this for myself, it's, it's it's a little overwhelming like i've seen other people do it but like when you when you study something in the bible for yourself it's it's different <laughs> it takes on a whole another like i i know that i know now um but what so how i started this is i said okay we know we know the scripture we know the scripture of the promise that was given in Acts. I'm, I'm sorry, was this Acts? This is Galatians, Galatians chapter three, where zero to 430 years, the Torah is going to, from, from the promise to the Torah. So what I, how I started this out is I said, well, if we know that it's going to be 430 years, um, then let me just, let me just put Abraham's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to fix this real quick. There we go. Okay, so I said, let me just start off with Abraham at 75 years old, because we know he was 75 when that happened. And then Moses, we know that Moses was 80 years old when he was when he went to the wilderness, because the scripture says that too. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to put that scripture up there. Um, but Moses was 80 years old when the Torah was given. So I said, so knowing that, I should just be able to fill in the blanks. And that's exactly what I did. I just went from Genesis to when Isaac was born to when Jacob was born, because we got scriptures for all this. We know that Abraham died when he was 175. The scripture says that. I don't have the reference on here. But 
basically, I, that's, that's how I did this process to come up with all of these numbers. And the only number that is may throw things off a little bit is this Levi, because we don't know exactly when he was born, but we do know it had to be within uh, it, within this 241 and 251. It, it has to be within that time period. Okay, so that's that's how, that's how I did this. And the reason the reason this is important is because just like the answers we got when we first when I first when we first got on the call and I asked people the question, when you see four hundred years, who's that referring to? And we got different answers. That's because the world the world even the world believes the egyptians were in egypt for 400 years just think about all the movies you've seen like the ten commandments think about the prince of egypt think about um whenever when anyone refers to slaves and being as a hebrew slaves even the world knows even if they whether they choose to believe it or not they know that the Israelites were slaves for 400 years. That's what they, that's what they say anyway. But from from this timeline that we created and, and we're going to go into, we can see that is completely false. So if that's false, then that means we need to figure out who are the people that are going to be in bondage for 400 years. It can't be this group if, if we're going to be serious about studying the scriptures. It, it, it cannot, I mean, 400 years is not 215 years. Some people, and so some people make the argument, uh, as we looked at earlier, some people make the argument that, well, this 430 years is the same. Well, we see that's a, that that can't be true either. It can't be within it can't be within this 430 years because the children of Israel weren't in Egypt for for 400 years. So, I'm going to show you one of the ways that this lie has propagated. We're going to go to um we're going to go to a scripture in I believe it's Genesis. Um, and part part of the problem has to do with the translations. So one second. Let's go to Genesis 15. I'm sorry, I, I went to the wrong one. We're supposed to go to this one, right? Uh, the one in Galatians, Galatians 3, 17. That's the one. <clears throat> Amen. Um, what'd you say, Ty? Amen. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> maybe, oh, maybe, it's uh, maybe it's Oh, I, I'm oh, in. Man. Okay. Okay. Because it's so quiet. I just want to let you know we're still here. Okay, good. Thank you. I appreciate it. I needed that. I needed that. Uh, I, I, um, I wanted to look at one of the, the, the mistranslations in the Bible, and I just... 
thought I had it written down, but I don't see it. So let me search for it real quick. Um, slaves in, in Canaan and Egypt. Four hundred years. I'm sorry, y'all. I I don't know why I messed this up. <laughs> I thought I had this uh, scripture written down, and now I'm uh I'm not seeing it. One second. Take your time, Joel. We're cool. Just take your time. Um, you don't have to rush because people got to go to work. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I knew you was going to say some slick <laughs> stuff, Ty. Anyways, I was just saying, you know what? It's all right. I support you, Joe. You you can do this. <laughs> it is okay, Joe. It's all right. I, I want to see you too. Ty's just being extra. Don't mind him. Yeah. I'm... Man, I don't. Oh, here. Okay, it's it's in here. Uh, four hundred thirty, four hundred thirty. Exodus. Ah, here it is. Exodus twelve. Okay, Exodus chapter twelve, verse forty, I believe. Yes. Okay. Exodus twelve forty. It says, Now the sur sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was four hundred and thirty years. So this this verse right here has caused a lot of problems. We just we just mapped it out. I mean, we just we just looked. We just looked at the timeline. There's no possible way that the children of Israel were in Egypt for 430 years. Because what we, what we saw here is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Once we get to Jacob and the children of Israel going into Egypt, already 290 years has passed. And from 290 to 505, that's 215 years. So it's not possible. So why does this Exodus 1240 say, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years? This Can I say something? Go ahead. You're not asking to talk. I was saying, well, we know that like Jacob, Jacob mean also is synonymous with Israel. We know that uh -huh. the Bible all the time takes a word, but it means something. It's using that word because that's like the origin, at least. And so yeah. Egypt, we yeah. know that Egypt can mean darkness. Egypt could also probably mean Babylon, New Babylon. It could mean many things. If you just take it at face value, you think Egypt. But if you go, wait a minute. Is the Bible saying Egypt, but it, it's meaning or pointing to something else? That's that's a that's a good way to think about it. That's good, Ty. I like that one. It is because because we we saw we, when we were looking at Egypt earlier, we saw that Egypt also means bondage. To give you an example. House of bondage. Exodus 13:3. It says, And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So when you see Egypt, it's referred to the house of bondage. 13:14, it says the same thing. Lord brought us out from the Egypt, from the house of bondage. 
Exodus 20, same thing. Land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Deuteronomy says the same thing. Uh, house of bondage. It's in it's all throughout the scriptures. You see, you see Egypt being referred to the house of bondage because Egypt in Hebrew it means it's Mitzrayim, and the root of Mitzrayim it means bondage. So that is one thing, but it's it's simpler than what Ty just said. That's what I would. That's what I used to think about the scripture. Here, if you notice, when you read this verse in a different version, it says, now the time, footnote, that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. Whenever you see a footnote, I don't let that just go by. Because what that's saying is, there's some discrepancy in man in the manuscripts. So where's the footnote? This, this this footnote, I don't really like it as much because it doesn't really tell you exactly um, what the other translation says. But I don't see I'll, a footnote. I'll show you. But... It's, it's, it says FN right here. Oh, oh, I see. It, it's going too fast. Let me just hold it on there. It's, it's a small, it says after it says now the time, do you see the FN next to it on verse 40? No, are you in X? <laughs> no, I'm in Exodus. Is my screen freezing? Is my screen freezing? Yeah, I think so because it's only showing X. Okay, I'm a uh, I'm a reshare. Man, I can't wait to get home so I can have some decent internet. All right, let's try this again. Okay, do you see it now? No? Yeah, I see Now it. the time. Okay, it's a footnote. It says, now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. The reason that there is a footnote is because the Bibles that we use today are based on what's called the Masoretic text. So you see the Hebrew? And then right at the top here, it says Masoretic Text. Basically, the modern translations that we use, like the King James Version, they, they are translated from Hebrew to English using a manuscript that was created by the Masoretes. So that's why it's called the Masoretic Text. But the Masoretic Text, it's good, but it's not the oldest text. There's an older text called the Septuagint. In the Septuagint, which is the translation that Christ, whenever you read the Gospels, Christ, he quotes from the Septuagint version of the Bible. The apostles, when they're quoting, they make like whenever they reference like some a scripture in the Old Testament, They'll reference not from the Masoretic text, but they reference from the Septuagint. So many people consider the Septuagint a better version to use, even though it's not written in, in, in Hebrew, it's written in Greek. It was, it was translated from scholars from Hebrew to Greek so that the people during that time could read it for those that couldn't read Hebrew. But it's way older than this Masoretic text. So what the what the septuagint says is now the time that the sons of israel lived in canaan and egypt was 430 years does that make sense 
Well, I, I, I know I said that. a whole lot, but um, that that's a big difference. Canaan and Egypt. So if we go back to our timeline, we the the, the children of Israel were living in Canaan when Abraham left. When he left to go, you know, he left when he was 75 years old, Genesis 12, 4, to go to a land that he knew nothing about. He had, he, he, he uh, operated in faith and he chose to do what God told him to do. Uh, despite, despite how hard that was going to be. And his family ultimately lands in the land of Canaan. So Isaac and Jacob, they grow up in the land. Canaan. It wasn't called Israel then because it was the land of the Canaanites. So they dwelt in Canaan. They were sojourners, just like God told them they would be. But when Jacob dies, I'm sorry, we're not right before Jacob dies, 17 years before he dies, then he goes to eat go, goes to Egypt. So now he's no longer in Canaan anymore. He's in Egypt. So approximately half the time they were in Canaan, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then uh, the other half of the time, they were in Egypt. So they were in Canaan and they were in Egypt. The problem is the translation that we use is not a good one. This verse is not, it, it just says Egypt. Um, uh, but before I go any further, um, any questions about that? Does anybody want to see that? Um, uh, anybody want to see see it uh, somewhere else? Somewhere else. You you could you could show it, but based off of that, okay. that ain't what Jehovah was talking to Abraham about. It, it doesn't it doesn't seem like it does it. It doesn't seem like that's what he was talking to him about. Because it just doesn't add up. The math doesn't add up. Um, okay, I lost my spot. Let's go back to Exodus 12. So, so now we we understand this. This is why this is why these footnotes you have to pay attention to them because. The, the the Septuagint text is not the only text that says that. There's another text called the Sumerian, the the Sumerian manuscript, and both of these texts are older than than the manuscripts we use now, and they both say lived in Egypt and in the land of Canaan. So here here's some notes i i forgot it, it, it has notes on this too uh it says the samaritan pentateuch reads now the sojourning of the children of israel and of their fathers in the land of canaan and in the land of egypt was 430 years so manus you know there's there was lots of manuscripts of the bible found many 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 manuscripts and most of them are pretty much the same but every now and then you'll have a word that's different here one that is added or one that's removed uh or one that's like spelt differently and so if in the cases where our modern translators use a translation that uh, uh, used the manuscript and translated that manuscript that had an error well that error now gets into our bibles it also says the Alexandrian copy of the L L LXX is the Septuagint I was telling you about. It has the same reading and the same statement is made by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3.17, who reckons from the promise made to Abraham to the giving of the law. It says that these three witnesses have the truth, the chronology chronology itself proves for it is evident that the descendants of Israel did not dwell 430 years in Egypt. While it is equally evident that the period from Abraham's entry into Canaan to the Exodus is exactly that number. So this is 
this is mind blowing. This is mind blowing to me because now I know all of these movies are wrong. All of these uh, cartoons, all the Sunday school lessons I've been taught is wrong. Even worse, all the pastors I heard preach on this were wrong. And the church is still teaching this today. And so I had to ask myself, why in the world would they propagate this when it's so easy to debunk? I did it basically in two hours. Just that, that presentation, that timeline I just showed you, I did most of that work in just two hours, getting the dates. I thought it was going to take a lot longer, but it didn't. And I'm like, if I know this, I know they know it. I mean, there's people that this is all they do is study the Bible. So this is too big all of a thing to miss. A blank screen. Okay. Yeah, me too. I didn't know if you were showing something. It's a blank I'm, screen. I'm not showing any. No, I'm not showing anything right now. Okay. But th thanks for letting me know. My inter this internet is real slow. So anyway, the point the point being like, how how did this happen? And so one of the things I did is I started looking at different commentators, and how do they how do they describe this like? How do they reconcile these passages? 430 years, 400 years, where the children of Israel were really slaves, 400 years. So one of the first people I went to, he tried to explain this away by saying, Moses must have been adopted uh, or someone throughout the line of Moses adopted him. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. I was like, okay, moving on next. Now, not, he's not talking about the daughter of Pharaoh. He's he's saying that someone else, two two generations of family members are missing in the text, and so he he comes out with this long explanation to why he thinks that the thinks that's the case. Looking at it from the Hebrew, I said, okay, this guy really doesn't know what he's talking about. So then I go to another commentator, and then that that commentator has pages and pages of notes trying to make it make sense that the children of Israel were in Egypt for 400 I, I really, I literally just couldn't understand it at all. I was like, what is he talking about? I was like, this doesn't make sense. There's so much stuff here and none of it makes sense at all. And I, I remember I went, I went to a, another commentator as well then I saw a third reason why the children of Israel must have been slaves for 400. So it's like every time I looked, I saw a different reason. And I was like, man, this is this is terrible. Um, nobody seems to have a solid answer to to this. And I'm, ta I'm talking about the the scholars that most people look up to to get their information when they're studying Bible, you know. So I started getting upset. I'm like, I really think they're just lying to us now because this makes no sense. Every single every single scholar has a different reason and none of the reasons make any logical sense whatsoever. And they have to spend pages and pages of, of notes trying to, you know, conjure up a reason instead of just looking at the text for what it says. So the, the, the impl implications of 430 years not being the same as the 400 years is that they got everything wrong and someone else, some other group of people must be the children of Israel. So can you think of any group of people that was in bondage for 400 years or more? And the key. You know we can. I, I know, but I want someone. Yes. To, I want someone to, yes. Okay. Who? 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 Ty. Oh, you want me to say it? 
Uh, yeah, I will, I will say the nice version. I'll say the nice version because everybody ain't ready. Yes, please. The yes. African Americans. The African Americans. So, so what I did, I mean, we we've already been studying this, but I know we got a new person here. So let me. We we looked at a few different maps. Like this is my favorite one. And we see that the kingdom of Judah was here in Africa and right by the slave coast. Um, and I have, I still have a ton of things that I haven't showed yet. But my mom asked me a question and I asked myself the same question. Okay, I said the African Americans, though, we were in bondage for 400 years, but we weren't slaves for 400 years. So I was like, can this really, I mean, we in the, in a literal sl sense of slavery, some people will say, well, still, st still in slavery today because of the 13th amendment. Anybody know about the 13th amendment and how it still allows slavery today? If you don't, then I'll, I'll show you. No, I don't. I, I want to see. Okay, good. All right. I'm bringing up this gov this National Archives website. The 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, Abolition of Slavery. This is what this is all about. Uh, it says, passed by Congress on January 3rd, blah, blah, blah. Um, the amendment abolished slavery in the United States. So 1863, that's when Lincoln gave his Emancipation Proclamation, but two years later, they added this uh, amendment because 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 really the Emancipation didn't fully abolish slavery, but it was the start start. So how does still exist? Well, this is Section One of the Thirteenth Amendment. Amendment it says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the united states or any place subject to their jurisdiction so the way slavery is legal today is if you're punished for a crime Slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. So, hey, so you know. yeah, let this one, I think, let, let Jace say something first and then Ty. What were you saying, Jace? I said, so pretty much like going to prison or going to jail. Academic yes. Academic. Yes. It does. What were you so saying, Ty? In the South, in the South, when they had slaves, I thought that's what it was. That, that was the Thirteenth Amendment. I couldn't remember, but in the South, they had slaves, and it. A lot of things comes to money. Come, it boils down mm -hmm. to money and greed. But yep, they would have slaves, and then once they were freed, the slaves no longer had to pick cotton. They they could get off the fields. But the the um, the uh, their masters at the time, they were like, "How am I supposed to make money?" Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so what they did was, they would uh, get in cahoots, put the people in jail, and go. Now that you're in jail, you can come back to my land because now you're being punished. And so the slavery kept on going. It was almost like a gray area that they that they took advantage of. Exactly. You said everything that I was going to say. Um, and in fact, I even have some pictures of it that maybe I can show you. Uh, yeah, let me bring some of those pictures up. And this is. Uh, I agree completely with what Ty said. Um, 
once slavery was done with, the South said they saw they, they wouldn't be able to make as much money anymore. They had to come up with a new way. And it was not really a new way, it's the old way. It's just they're exploiting it now. They say, oh, there's still there's still a clause in here where we can treat people as slaves. And so I didn't used to believe this. I thought it was just people just making excuses for black people when they used to say slavery still exists here. But I went on the FBI's website uh, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw that there, when it, in, ter in terms of crime that's done here in America, whites outnumber blacks uh, by a tremendous amount. It, it, it was overwhelming when I saw it. But in terms of people that are they, they go to jail and remain in prison the blacks percentage wise outnumber the whites by a lot and when i when I, what i saw was i mean i could just go to the website um you could any of you could, could do you? it too <laughs> yeah could you because you you're recording it yeah, okay say fbi statistics on crime and i think it was 2019 it was a study that they did and they broke it down by race uh yeah includes data i wasn't planning on doing this so i don't have it ready i got it on my other laptop but let me see i'll see if i can search fbi crime statistics by race i think it was 2019 or 2020. uh let's try this one so the so black people there's there's one category that we outnumbered the 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 whites in and that was the first one, which is not a good one at all. None of them are good, but murder and, and non-negligent non manslaughter. Uh, I believe that's the one. No, no, it's not that one, because that one, th they're 3 million to 1.4. It was one of the murder ones. But all of the, so, so 3 million to 1.4. No, 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 this is the one. I'm sorry. So. In terms total arrests, black people are arrested about a thousand thousand more than whites. Rape, whites are almost double us. So there, there was two of them. There's murder and robbery. Robbery is just a little bit more. Aggra aggravated assault. Whites is 124,000, blacks is 75,000, burglary is 59,000, whites is 28,000. That's more than double. Larcenary theft, this is more than double, 147, 329. Motor vehicle theft, white people more than double. Arson, violent crime, everything pretty much except for these two murder and robbery and so so this is the arrest Th this category right here is the uh, total arrest by race and on your own time if you just search this up you'll see you can go through all of them like i did and you'll see that we're outnumbered in pretty much all of them gambling drug drug abuse this is more than double and all other offenses, a million to 425,000. So I was like, well, why are we, why do we have so many more people though in prison percentage wise if 
they are double what we are you know why and then it's it all started making sense <laughs> we've been slaves for a long time and it, it never stopped and the oppression remember i said slavery and oppression so i'm reading a book right now called the color of law and in this book they they are expa explaining how uh racism against african americans was legalized so it's 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 by law by by law not not private citizens being racist but how it's in the law books and i'm only on the third chapter second or third chapter and my mind is already like whoa some of the main points that it's talking about right now is the uh refusal of the government to house negroes so most people associate projects with black people right so projects initially were, were not created for blacks they were created for white people that came home from war like during world war uh one and world war two when they came back the soldiers came back there was not enough housing so they created projects in order to house the soldiers and initially there were there were so many people both black and white but they refused to create more housing for the black people so what the black people had to do was basically build their own houses so we lived in dilapidated housing like shacks and whatever they could find is what they would build build with in terms of homes in the in the african american community so they refused to do that later on what happens is you have even more people coming back from world war ii so they have to build more housing but this time they build better better places better projects and these house projects are more permanent so what they did is they moved the whites to the better homes the white soldiers the better uh, project facilities and then they then they allowed the blacks to come into the ones that were not so nice that the whites just left and and when they moved the white people out they moved all of the white people out all of them so the communities stay segregated and i mean you might have a few white person here or there straggling but eventually all of them would move and they would get the better places so another thing i i learned about sundown towns curfews i don't know if you've ever heard that but there there used to be law on the books in cities in almost every state if not all the states where black people have curfews and this goes all the way up to like the 70s there are still still uh towns called sundown towns where they would play a, a a ringing siren and if the black people were outside before the siren or after the siren went out and they were caught the cops could arrest them and they could go to jail uh also the segregated housing develops whenever there would be a new development built within the deeds if anybody bought a home in a development usually you have covenants and restrictions well the first restriction would normally be no black people allowed to live in this development this happened everywhere in the u.s and so that created more segregation and it was really bad because uh they, they gave an example in san francisco san francisco was supposed to be one of the least racist places because it's more liberal more progressive but they use san francisco as their example because they're like if there's racism in san francisco then there must be racism everywhere so in san francisco there was a an all-white neighborhood one one white family decided to sell their home even though it's against the law according to the bylaws they decided to sell their home to a black family. 
that one black family moves, I believe the community is called Richland, still Richland in San Francisco today, that that family moves in, then someone begins to do fear mongering, basically telling all the whites in the neighborhoods, black people are moving in. Your housing valuations are gonna go down because the blacks are coming in. Our neighborhoods are gonna be trashed. The black people are gonna start mingling with your, your sons and daughters, and they're gonna start having babies with each other. They're gonna rape your babies. All these types of things happening. So what would happen in, in many communities is that once a black person got into a community or a black family got into a white community, all of the whites would move out. And the ripple effect of that is all the money then leaves that area. So those communities now are the worst communities because there's all the taxes left. And the city governments, the county governments, they don't care about the African Americans as much. So those places turn into ghettos. And my mom told me about so, something that happened to her, to her and her family in Philly. Mom, you want to tell me what happened to your family? Or I guess our family? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was sharing with Joel that my dad, um, very fair skin, good hair. Many people um, thought he was white. Uh, well, he purchased a home in an all-white neighborhood. Um, in North Philadelphia. And so after the family started moving in, of course, my my uh, brothers and sisters were all, you know, multicultural, multicolors. And, and so when the neighbors noticed that we were a black family, um, they started moving out one by one. And uh, as I grew up in in that neighborhood, uh, that neighborhood became, uh, I would say, 99% black. Uh, and my as my dad in, integrated that neighborhood, um, that they thought he was white, and so the person was per allowed him to purchase the home, um, but. After that, when we moved in, uh, they began moving out. Mm -hmm. I, I I also wanted to mention uh, just a little bit going back to the uh, prison settings. If, if, if you remember uh, watching some of the movies, it was the blacks in prison that were building the railroad system. Yes. And that's why we get the song, I've been working on the railroad all the oh, live long days. Wow. I've been working on the railroad. Yeah, it came from prisoners that um, were required to do that type of work. I didn't know that. Didn't wow. Know that. Wow. Hey, Joel, we live with Nancy. And some of y'all may know Nancy, maybe not, but she was white. So when we came back from Philippines, we lived with her. And she told us one day because the conversation came up where her son-in-law or nephew, son-in-law, right? He's black. It's white. So the wife mm -hmm. is white. And he put a post up on either Instagram or something. And he's like, why is it that with my education? and my college degree and my accolades, I still have to use my white wife to get stuff done because my the color of my skin, right? And so Nancy came to me and she was like, Ty, is there still racism in America? I was like, are you serious, oh, wow. Nancy? There is. And so she's like 70 something years old and she, she loves, she loves, she loves us completely and she loves people completely. She she's not racist at all. She doesn't have a racist bone in her body, but she's also clueless. And but she told me she was like when she was growing up, they told her that black people, when they move into your neighborhoods, 
they have a plague. And they, she said, it's exactly like COVID, except the black people were COVID. That's how they presented it to them in their mind. So they thought, oh, we're going to get a disease or something. Yes, yes, exactly. So what I was telling you about the stories that I read about this in San Francisco, how the, the black people move in and the white people move out, it was propaganda. Uh -huh. And I was so happy because I was telling my mom what I was reading. And then she told me that story about what literally happened to them when they moved. And I'll give you one example in the book. There was a mayor, there was a mayor running for office in Detroit. And there, and what, I, what the opposing mayor did while they were campaigning in order to get all the white people not to vote for him, he, he mailed letters to the white communities. But what he did is he acted like they were meant for the black people, but just somehow they got into the white community. And in those letters, it said, a vote for me is a vote for you to be able to live in the white communities. So that mayor said that as if he was saying it to black people, black people thinking, oh, that's great. We'll be able to live in the nice neighborhoods. But he sent that to the white people so that they'll look at that other candidate as being like, oh, he's going to integrate us. And all the bad stuff that they're saying is going to happen is going to happen. Like, like diseases and everything like you were just talking about, Ty. The, the actual government candidates, that is the type of literature that they would mail to white people to scare them from living with black people. So you had on one level laws being put in place, and then you had on another level propaganda and then, then something worse you know, would happen. When the whites would move out of the community, they would, the, the realtors uh, would tell the whites to sell their houses for more, and they, they would inflate the prices. The black people are happy because now they can get out of their ghettos and move to nicer places but the prices are inflated sky high like they are now and so even when the black person could get into a nice neighborhood the prices were two three times more than what they should be and that's all by design uh, also going back to the prisons this this they also shocking. enslave you with a 30-year mortgage. Yes. That's hey, right. Uh, sorry to interrupt you guys. I am driving, and um, my window won't come up, so it's kind of loud. So I love you guys. I'm going to head out just tonight, okay? So I can't hear you. And that's on okay. my side. Yeah. But I love, love you, you guys. It was amazing. Love Thank you. you so much. Okay. Bye, Rose. Bye. So, Bye. So, so the map you see right here, it says incarcerated workers are paid pennies as prison state governments reap the benefits. So, you know, most of us know that in prison, you you work, you don't make money. It goes to the prison kind of is the a form of slavery. Money. Yes, it prison is. Prison is a form of slavery. Yep. And if you look at these dark blue states they they're forced you know when they work they make absolutely zero dollars i mean most time you only make cents an hour per hour but these dark blue they they get absolutely nothing and in the um, you know the prison system is a billion dollar industry they make billions of dollars off of prisoners. So my only point in this is not racist or anything like that. It's just to show there has been slavery and oppression. 
and and there's still slavery if you're considering prisons so when we were reading genesis chapter 12 and god tells abraham your 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 descendants are going to be enslaved and they're going to be oppressed this is just another way we fit the bill we've talked about many other ways we haven't even gotten into the curses yet because i wanted to dive deep deeper into this first this prophecy but um let let me uh let's see what time it is okay i'll just go for just a little bit longer tiny bit longer and then we'll end uh so another another thing that was done that caused oppression so many people have heard the phrase black wall street um black wall street was in tulsa oklahoma in the 1920s i believe it was the 1920s and black black wall street is it was basically a, a town where black people had their own businesses they had their you know their own hospital uh clinics i should say they had their own banks they had their own grocery stores i mean they were thriving the money the money that was made within black wall street would take a long time to leave meaning they kept the money within the community they supported each other and because they supported each other and they they were they were thriving they they had they had their own very industrious downtown area i mean they had their own engineers their own architects whenever they wanted to build buildings i mean they were doing it but if you've heard of the race riots that happened early early on during the race riot, riots systematically uh whites would come and and they burn down their buildings they burned down the whole town that was thriving i mean the and it wasn't just it wasn't just black wall street and uh and tulsa oklahoma there was there was many areas like that let me let me get a few examples uh if i go to my bookmarks here we go so this website right here is called the other black wall streets because many people know about black wall street but most people don't know about all the other places um let me so here's an area in in durham north carolina there was a place called the haiti community and this is what web du bois said about this area he said today today there is a singular group in durham where a black man may get up in the morning from a mattress made by a black man in a house which a black man built out of lumber which black man cut and planned he may put on a suit which he bought at a colored haberdashery dashery and socks knit at a colored mill he may cook victuals from a colored grocery on a stove which black men fashioned he may earn his living working for colored men, be sick in a co colored hospital and buried from a colored church. And the Negro ins Insurance Society will pay his widow enough to keep his children in school. This is surely progress. This is just one of the many towns where black people were doing very well. And during the race riots, this this town in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was thriving, and also here in Durham, North Carolina, they literally helicopters were riding over towns. I don't know if it was helicopters or planes. I forget. They would ride over buildings, and they would they they were dropping fire bombs and 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 dynamite, exploding all of these communities that black people built. Uh, this is cool too. It says Shepard Moore and Matt Merrick 
went on to found the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, which became the richest Black-owned company during that time and still has assets over $200 million. So this was, this is a, you know, thriving life insurance companies. I mean, stuff that we as people, Black people grown here, grown up here, have never even heard of this stuff. In Richmond, Washington, it was the same thing. Like, they, uh, they had many black people that were thriving, but oppression from the whites come in and this this was allowed by the government. Like like this, uh, what, what is this called again? This Black Wall Street here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Guess what? Not, not one person was held accountable for all of the businesses that were destroyed and and they they say that eight, they say that around 300 people died during those riots black people died but they also admit that they really have no idea how many people died because a lot of people died in mass graves so when they kill or when they killed people they put them in mass graves and they they have no idea a lot of people had to leave their own homes they had to flee the cities um and this is supposed to be after slavery so even if there is no slavery just showing you a few examples of it was still bad and it's still it's still uh there's been oppression but um the good thing is according to the prophecy it says they shall afflict them 400 years. So that means it has to come to an end. And just like the just like God did with Egypt, he's he's going to bring plagues. He's going to bring he's going to bring disasters as nations refuse to heed more things will just get worse and worse and worse and worse because Yah is pleading for his people Israel. Now, I know that's a lot to say, and and I would love to prove it more, but we're running out of time. So <laughs> we'll keep we'll keep going with this next week because I, I really wanted to get into more scriptures to 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 show you, you know these timelines and everything, but it's not enough time. So We'll just continue next week. Hey, can I say something before you we all go? Yeah. The scripture you just read, when you read it, I just kept hearing God is pleading, but if you don't know his voice, you don't hear the pleading. All you see is catastrophe. And you have nothing to link it to. Mm-hmm. So for, for people out there who are like, why is this happening? That's why we need to know it so that we can share. Yeah. But we got to know it too. Right now, you're the only one that knows it. We just, we just heard it. But we got to get it in our spirit too so that we can share it. Yes. Yes. That's, that's why I'm a... I'm putting this on on YouTube, and I'm um, I'm doing my best to explain it as well as I can because that's 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 my point. That's my point in studying all this is because I want to know what, how do we get out of this. Hey, Joe. How do we? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I'll just piggyback on time, man. It's, you know, self knowledge is is more important than just taking anybody's word for it and that's why they say show yourself approved and you know study study the word and you get to know god for yourself and, mm -hmm. and getting into understanding make sure you have an understanding because you know like like ty just said things are happening in the world and everybody's confused and going crazy even questioning why god hasn't saved us or why is god allowing this and yeah you know um it comes from it comes from the understanding the knowledge and you really broke down some serious stuff there that a lot of people probably have been like, well, I never would have heard that at church. I never would have heard about black slavery and the projects 
and you know how we're still in slavery about the amendment you know nobody would expect it to hear that at a bible study but it's 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 so important because if you do know your word it's still the same thing even though it's not in church so yeah i, yeah. I, I totally agree it's it's about self awareness and, and god is 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 pulling us out of the sanctuary, out of the pews and saying, no, you come find me for yourself. You stop going and just depending yeah. on what you're hearing over the word, hearing over the pulpit, come find me out for yourself. I'm not just in the Bible. I mean, your everyday life. I mean, your job. I mean, your situation. I mean, your circumstance. I'm right there. And if you look in the Bible, you'll see yourself there too, if you will study. So that's a testament even to myself that, you know, I need to strive to seek his face a lot more even in my own life, you know, even though I have a knowledge of history, but we don't know it all. <laughs> and, right. and, and, we, and we never can, but we can, we can help ourselves to be more enlightened and to not panic and not, you know, uh, my pastor always says, he was like, you know, sometimes you think that you, you're dying and you're having a heart attack or something like that. And it could just be gas. He was like, you know, it, it's just gas. It's, it's not that you're dying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, but but if you don't know anything, if you don't have any kind of understanding, you you believe almost anything. You will believe that you're actually doomed. So um, I'm thankful yeah. for your platform, brother. That's all I want to say. I didn't mean to hold you. Well, hey man, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. What what you what you said, both you and Ty, what came to my mind was Romans eleven twenty five. Says for I would not, meaning I don't want you to be brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to israel until the fullness of the gentiles become in so paul was letting us know he was paul he's letting the romans know israel is blinded in part and we have been blinded and the reason we were blinded is because we rejected our Messiah, we disobeyed the commandments. Deuteronomy 28, 1. He says how all the blessings come. If he exactly. says it shall come to pass, if you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, you know, and observe all these commandments, he lays down every single blessing. But then we know on the flip side, which we're going to probably get into next week. All the curses that happen when you disobey, you disobey. and well, as as we read all these curses, it's really you. Re that's when you're really gonna see. Oh, this ain't nobody but us. It can't. It can't be. It can't be the people that the world says is Israel right now, because have they gone through 400 years of slavery and oppression? Um, no. No. So that that means that it has we have to look look deeper and study this stuff for ourselves, like you were saying. But uh, anyways, that was that was really good. good. Uh, so we can uh we can get ready to go, and we'll pick up next week. Heavenly Father, we love you. We uh, thank you. We praise you for your word. We thank you that you keep opening our eyes. I thank you just for me. Like, as I'm studying these things, Father, you just really blowing blow my mind away. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited because I'm unlearning all these lies. And you're taking away, you're removing the blinders off. The more I study you, the more you're moving these blinders off. And I thank you that you're moving the blinders off for all of us. I thank you, Father, for anointing us to be able to hear and to understand what you're doing uh, in, this, in this world today so that we can be a part of it, so we can uh, uh, have a hand in bringing more people into your kingdom. We ask, Father, that you anoint us, anoint, anoint each and every one, of us father to do what you've called us to do uh and and help us not to rely on our own strength but to walk according to your spirit and not to rely on our own flesh father we love you we give you praise I ask you uh protect everyone through the week uh in yeshua's name we pray amen amen thank you amen. for being a master teacher
Good night, everyone. Yeah. Good night, you guys. Love y'all. Good night. Good night, everybody. All right.